Anyway, so uh, many thanks for to the organizers for arranging this wonderful conference. Uh, it's a lot of exciting talks, and thank you uh, for kind of uh, inviting me to present results of our work. Uh, so today I'll tell you about a recent project uh, that uh, we're doing with uh, Yuta Ashida and Atachi Mamoglu, and really all the credit uh, for this work should go to Yuta. Uh, and uh, hopefully the paper will be on the archive soon. Um, so it's work in progress. All the questions, comment, criticism will be greatly uh, appreciated. And it will actually build on uh, kind of some earlier work that they have done with several uh, collaborators. So this is an outline uh, of my talk. I will begin by sort of briefly uh, defining what is uh, WaveGuide uh, QED for those uh, who haven't heard this uh, terminology yet. Uh, then I'll talk about some of the interesting regimes which people have started exploring in the last few years. And uh, my uh, emphasis uh, will be on just new theoretical uh, formalism uh, that uh, we're working on in order to solve this waveguide QED in strong coupling. And uh, I'll uh, sort of introduce the formalism. I'll show you some of the consequences so, and they're, they're very interesting. There are some interesting bound state, uh, light matter bound state, which we'll discuss, some interesting renormalization uh, of mass uh, of uh, particles, like of single particle potentials. I'll uh, add some speculation about possible relation uh, to experiments. At this point, we didn't really try to put in detailed numbers, but I think the analogy is very suggestive. And if, uh, uh, Time for me. I'll also talk about uh, sort of connection of uh, this work to the question of super radiant phase transitions, so-called no-go theorems, which have been subject of active discussions uh, in the last uh, couple of years. Okay, so let me define wavegate uh, QED. So if you remember uh, your basic QED, then it usually relies on perturbative treatment uh, of interaction between. Uh, light and matter, and the argument is uh, that it's proportional to fine structure constant, which is one over 137. For example, if we think about lamp shift, it's fine structure constant cube. Uh, uh, but this is all based on uh, particles in free space. Uh, so what has been happening in the last uh, few years is uh, that people uh, learned to uh, make uh, various uh, methods materials in which essentially electromagnetic modes can be confined to uh, sizes which are much smaller uh, than uh, the wavelength uh, in free space. So, uh, and so the Hamiltonian which we uh, will be discussing looks uh, pretty simple, right? So for the time, actually in this talk, I will also, I will focus on just a single emitter. Uh, the same formalism can be generalized to many emitters, but I'll just for lack of time, focus on one. So think about one particle, right? It's subject to some uh, single particle potential and we will usually consider a double well potential. Uh, then of course there is kinetic energy, we assume it's a charged particle, so we have minimal coupling to electromagnetic field. And uh, then we have some uh, modes, which uh, we basically think of as modes, electromagnetic modes uh, of the waveguide. And vector potential, right, is just can be constructed uh, out of creation annihilation operators for uh, uh, for photons uh, operators uh, inside the waveguide. Okay, and so as I said, uh, what we'll be interested in uh, is uh, the regime in which light and matter interaction are strong, and experimentally this uh, can be achieved uh, by a strong spatial confinement uh, of modes. So this field actually has its own peculiar terminology. Don't ask me to explain why it happens. I guess it's just a historical reason. So if we think about basically G is light matter coupling divided by the frequency. You know, so typically perturbative regime is when it's much less than one. So when it's of the order of one tenth, people talk about ultra strong coupling. When it's of the order of one, it's called deep strong coupling. And it's greater than one, it's called extremely strong coupling. So uh, it, Again, I'll try to avoid using this terminology, but somehow uh, it's, uh, anyway, uh, what we will be thinking about is really regimes when uh, sort of light matter interaction is of the order of one uh, or larger. 
And uh, so uh, these type of models are relevant to a variety of experimental systems. Uh, let's say we can think about uh, some kind of transmission lines. So this would be microwave photons and then artificial atoms like based on Josephson junctions, qubits. And there are plasmonic uh, nanoparticles, photonic cavities. Uh, I will also show some examples when this strong coupling uh, has been shown to be relevant uh, in, uh, for polaronic chemistry. Uh, so I'll not go through actual kind of justification and through the numbers uh, of why the like variety of these platforms uh, sort of uh, are in the regimes of uh, strong light matter interactions. So uh, what uh, I will be, uh, but what I want to point out is uh, that if we think about traditional uh, approaches to solving light matter uh, uh, problems, interacting problems, then uh, even when we want to go beyond perturbation theory, if we want to do say uh, uh, something like exact diagonalization, what we're often forced to do uh, is to just truncate our Hilbert space, just because you know we can uh, only uh, diagonalize finite size matrices, uh, which uh, means that we're only keeping a finite number of photons. Uh, and that of course is very suspicious because uh, the Hamiltonian as written, actually does not conserve the number of photons. And when G is large, uh, light matter coupling can actually create uh, many photons. Then uh, another common approximation is uh, to say, well, actually we can really limit our, when we talk about uh, our emitter, I, you can approximate it just by a two level system. Roughly think about it like this. Well, we start with some microscopic potential, which is a double well potential. And then we have two states, uh, uh, to lowest energy states, uh, and they are split by tunneling, so they uh, split into symmetric and anti-symmetric state, and we assume that they're separated by large enough gap from all the other states uh, in uh, the single particle potential, so uh, therefore we can just really just retain these two states, and that's our two-level system, and not worry about all the other states. And then there are also issues about uh, the A-squared term. Okay, so let me not uh, talk about now. We'll take care of it exactly, and I'll explain to the end why uh, this A squared term has been a subject of uh, such controversy. Okay, but uh, what I want uh, to argue is uh, that uh, what we hopefully you will see in this talk that uh, all of uh, these assumptions become, uh, let's say, basically, let's say, disregarding the uh, uh, sort of truncating. Uh, Hilbert space in terms of the number of photons is very dangerous, like for strong coupling, approximating uh, uh, any, you know, like true Hilbert space, actual single particle potential by a two-level system also breaks down when light matter coupling uh, is strong enough, and an A squared term doesn't get, uh, make a difference. And uh, so mostly I will uh, sort of, just to show you, uh, we will uh, obviously I want to pre present some results for some concrete models. So kind of uh, a model that uh, I will look at uh, can be thought of uh, as a sort of uh, array of cavities so that for photons, we have some effective thin binding model just characterized uh, by sort of J, which comes from overlap of cavity mode and some energy of photons. And okay, so this would be this photonic dispersion. Actually, later on, I'll also comment on uh, other types of dispersion. And uh, as I said, for the uh, particle, we I will, uh, sort of work with this double well potential, like which we can easily parameterize by something like, okay, I mean, details are not important, but we'll, like, we will do specifically calculations for this form uh, of the double well potential. Okay, so uh, here is uh, the essence uh, of uh, the talk. So uh, let, let us write our Hamiltonian, right? We have a minimal coupling, right, between momentum uh, and vector potential, a single particle potential, we have uh, photons. Okay, an obvious uh, thing to do is uh, uh, just take the quadratic part uh, of this Hamilton. Oh, and also, okay, uh, notice uh, that I, I assume that the characteristic question. For one second, I think uh, there's uh, a that the question from Leo Radzohovsky. Let me just quickly hear what that is. But it's good That's for everyone else. If you could put questions in the Q&A, uh, that would be a little easier than, than raising the hand. Yes. So it's, oh, I'm okay. sorry about so that. So what's the so question? Just, yeah, uh, yeah, Eugene, I guess you... Now I realize you may get to it. I, I, you didn't. I wanted to know what the relation of G is to the to the minimal coupling, the charge, and and I guess that's what yeah, you're so about. Yeah. So that to... right. So that is like that was defined here, right? So this is it's proportional to let's say this uh, 
field amplitude and it's proportional to square root of uh, the frequency of the photon modes and its charge. So there is an exclusive okay. expression you can write. Thank you, thank you. Does... Right. Okay, uh, right. So, okay, so the, uh, what we do for as a first step, we want to separate all the terms which are quadratic in the photon operators. So notice that in the kinetic energy, right, we also have a squared term, right? So therefore we also need to include it. Uh, we can diagonalize this just doing Bogolub of transformation and uh, this uh, uh, gives us uh, uh, effective coupling constant between this new kind of transformed diagonalized uh, uh, eigenmodes, electromagnetic modes uh, and momentum. Right. And this also gives us uh, the photonic frequency. Notice uh, something quite peculiar, and that will play uh, an interesting role, that essential when coupling gets strong enough, uh, that there is one photonic mode, which actually, uh, which really has energy renormalized quite dramatically. So the energy goes up as proportional to this effective coupling G, whereas all the other modes essentially stay uh, uh, as they were. So from this point of view, like when we go to strong coupling, effective, uh, like the effective energy uh, of the modes gets strongly renormalized. Another kind of peculiar uh, aspect is that now, if we look at the coupling constant after performing this Bogolubov transformation, when we just first increase the microscopic coupling constant, they increase, but then eventually they start to decrease again. So actually when G gets uh, much larger uh, than one, uh, then actually this, uh, uh, effective coupling constant to the three normalized photonic operators, uh, it actually decays uh, either as one over G to kind of uh, the modes which are not strongly renormalized and the mode which has been strongly uh, renormalized decays as one over square root of the coupling constant. And here has, uh, uh, comes uh, the uh, kind of the main part of the approach. And so we, uh, and that's a unitary transformation uh, that uh, Yuta uh, came up with. So it's something like, as you can see, it's very strongly inspired by things like Polaron transformation that we're used to uh, condense in condensed matter systems. Basically what we want to do, we're trying to get rid, you see, we have this linear coupling between momentum uh, of the particle and photon uh, creation operators. We're trying to get rid of it, of this coupling. And so we do the operator like, so you can think about it uh, as the analog of the Polaron transformation. You can write explicitly uh, what this is. Another way of thinking about this operator is uh, that it entangles light and matter degrees of freedom, because now you can see that after the transformation position uh, of uh, the particle, it gets shifted in such a way that it involves uh, the amplitude uh, of a magnetic field. On the other hand, uh, uh, creation annihilation operators uh, for the photon, uh, they uh, get uh, uh, transformed uh, in such a way that they now sort of include momentum uh, of uh, the uh, of the particle. And after this transformation, as we said, uh, kind of linear coupling between P and electromagnetic field is gone, but uh, we still have a uh, light matter interaction. And uh, this light matter interaction is uh, appears in a very unusual way. Actually, it seems the argument in the single particle potential, right? So now single particle potential involves not just position of the particle, but also electromagnetic field amplitude. But notice something uh, very quite remarkable, because if we think about this theta, right? Okay, it involves photonic operators, but it involves this coupling constants, psi, which we said that strong coupling actually go to zero. So in this transformed frame, actually light matter interaction uh, disappears when we go to strong coupling. And this is why uh, 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 we call it asymptotically decoupling transformation. In the regime of ultra strong light matter coupling, actually in, in this frame, after this transformation, light matter interaction is switched off. And I want to contrast this uh, to uh, sort of the, uh, oh, okay, let me not I'll illustrate this uh, later. So, okay, some of you uh, sort of, uh, like those of you who remember uh, your kind of quantum optics may, uh, this may look familiar. So there is a very famous transformation in optics uh, called PZW transformation, but notice uh, it's different, right? So the difference is uh, that in the PZW transformation, what uh, one uses is actually vector potential for magnetic field, and it's actually coordinate uh, of the particle rather than momentum. So after the PZW transformation, you see that we still have linear coupling uh, to, uh, 
uh, between the uh, kind of position uh, of uh, the particle and the electric field, right? Whereas uh, uh, in our case, essentially all the coupling uh, has been uh, absorbed into this uh, effective potential. So uh, just as an illustration of uh, what, why uh, this uh, is a useful transformation, let me just show you uh, results. So a lot of, some of the results. So I, we, we take this like two level potential and then we can just solve, you know, like we really take a large number of uh, photons and solve the problem uh, either in, uh, in the original kind of Coulomb gauge or in the PCW gauge or in this asymptotically decoupled transformation. And we can count how many photons do we actually have. And just as I said, well, uh, at strong G, the advantage of asymptotic decoupling transformation is that actual light and matter decouple, and therefore the ground state actually has a vacuum of photons. In fact, you can compute that the ground state has a number of photons which decays as one over GQ. Uh, on the other hand, if you just try to do it in the original Coulomb gauge, you see that the number of photons actually grows as uh, the coupling strength. Uh, Okay, so uh, uh, one of the interesting features of uh, this transformation is uh, that we also uh, get strong renormalization uh, of uh, the effective mass uh, of the particle. I mean, you can also think about as some kind of polaronic dressing. Uh, in fact, uh, you can check uh, that. Uh, and, and of course, like if we think of about double wall potential, right? So we know that level spacing uh, will be in, uh, inversely proportional to the mass. So if the mass uh, gets heavier, level spacing gets smaller. So you can very easily check uh, that as we go to ultra strong coupling, uh, even though we had this very high energy state, which was far away, it's seemingly separated by a large gap. But when you make light matter interaction strong enough, actually all of the states get highly compressed. And the kind of the splitting between uh, these uh, lowest energy states is just is one over the coupling strength. Therefore, like the just doing truncation to two level systems would completely miss all of this uh, low line states, which we get in the regime of uh, ultra strong coupling. And uh, okay, and so now, okay, what uh, uh, we can do, as we said, just because light and matter uh, uh, sort of affect the couple so efficiently in uh, this new frame, uh, then uh, what you can do, you can now truncate, uh, like if you want to sort of do something beyond simple perturbation theory, let's say you can define a finite Hilbert space where you just keep up to a certain number of photons and up to a certain number of excited uh, states. But just because, uh, uh, sort of already in the ground state, we saw that the number of photons in this uh, AD frame is so small and then coupling is very small. And actually most of the coupling goes to, uh, to this end, like zeroth mode, like symmetric mode for the photons, which has a very high frequency whereas coupling to decreases. So you really have to keep fairly small number uh, of photons. Also notice something uh, kind of peculiar that actually the light, uh, so uh, when uh, like this perturbation theory like if you try to do this uh, approach, like this interaction strength, right, which is proportional to this psi, never grows to be uh, really large. Like sort of, it gets very small at strong interaction. It's naturally small for weak interactions. So uh, you can, uh, it's actually kind of, it does worst at some intermediate coupling interaction constant is of the order of one, but there we can check. So what, so far what we have seen that this AD frame uh, with some kind of like modest truncation of Hilbert space of photons really works across the entire range of uh, interactions. Okay, so uh, now let me just show you uh, some model like, you know, this two uh, well potential uh, and that uh, cavity array. And we started with a parameter uh, range in such a way that the original uh, sort of uh, Bayer emitter frequency to Bayer photon frequency uh, was uh, uh, was one. And so now you can see that, okay, like, so for the emitter, we have the, uh, we had, uh, let's say the first uh, excited state, right? And then, but then on top of that, we had like a whole band of photonic excitations. And then we can uh, go to the second excited state uh, of uh, the emitter. And again, we have a whole bunch of photonic excitation because we have a continuum. But now we start cranking up interactions. And you see that we have uh, this, uh, like a whole, uh, a lot of low energy states which are going down. So this is based on the truncation, the in the AD frame. 
and what's the physical origin? Well, it's actually very easy. It's really those, like, you know, because of uh, this increase of the effective mass of the particle, basically, in the AD frame, the states can be thought of as just excitation of the emitter. They don't even involve light. But of course, when we go back to the original physical frame before the transformation, every one of this excitation involves both like an entangled state of emitter and light, right? It's only by with the virtue of going to this AD frame that now we can describe this excitation uh, in such uh, a simple uh, manner. So, uh, okay. So uh, there is another thing uh, that we can do. We can ask, uh, okay, so what about the effective potential, right? So if uh, light and matter effectively decouple, well, we can try to define some kind of effective potential uh, for the particle by taking expectation values, say, with respect to the vacuum state of photons, right? Or let's say, then of course, we can also introduce like residual interactions, but kind of natural first step is just to take uh, the uh, kind of like say, okay, well, in the AD frame, because coupling effectively disappears, we can just factorize the wave function, right? For meter and for, uh, for light. So what is uh, the uh, effective potential uh, for, for the emitter? And something quite interesting uh, happens uh, that actually the barrier gets strongly suppressed. I mean, it's uh, something that uh, you, can, you can think about in different uh, ways. So let's say apparently like in optics, actually people know that uh, like when people talk about some kind of the effect of like lamp shift effect of electromagnetic radiation of particle, it introduces some kind of smearing uh, of the position of the electron. So in essence, uh, it's very similar effect uh, on the amplified. So when you look at an electron, because it's strongly interacting with the electron field, it's sort of, it's, uh, it's kind of, it's spread out as a uh, wave packet. And as an effect, it sort of averages the potential. And therefore the point which used to be the kind of the maximal point of the potential, is now averaging over the effective potential over a finite range. But notice that this uh, is not something that gets kind of uh, 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 stronger and stronger as we go to strong coupling. Effective renormalization or in this AD frame, effective renormalization of this particle potential is strongest when coupling constant is of the order of one. And when we go to very strong coupling, then actually we sort of uh, go back to uh, high potential. Okay, so as I said, I'll uh, also add some uh, speculations. Uh, so one of the tempting uh, things, uh, Joel, I guess you're about to say that I'm running out of time. That is correct, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Please so, tell us very uh, quickly about the experimentalists and then we have some good questions. Uh, sorry, uh, you, okay. Please, so, please yeah. tell us quickly about the experiments and then we have a couple of good questions waiting. That's why the rush, but please I go see. ahead. Okay, so uh, one of the, very curious experiments uh, that uh, people in chemistry have been doing. They noticed uh, that uh, some of the chemical reaction get accelerated uh, when they uh, put them uh, inside cavities. And they actually argue, well, that this is a regime in which cavities are very strongly coupled to uh, sort of various like photon modes, well, basically some kind of vibrations uh, of charged uh, degrees of freedom. Well, it's very tempting to say uh, that we can try to explain this dramatic acceleration of chemical reaction by lowering of the potential barrier, because after all, what sets uh, the rate of the chemical reaction? Well, it's the probability to go over the barrier. So if you lower the barrier, uh, then uh, you can actually uh, clearly uh, make it easier to perform thermal activation across the bed. Uh, then uh, there were also very uh, interesting experiments which observed that if you put materials in a cavity or just introduce some kind of other type of coupling uh, to electromagnetic modes, say these experiments from uh, Ebison's uh, group in Strasbourg. So what they did, they took YBCO, uh, actually here uh, they uh, took nanoparticles and uh, so what they did, uh, they made them interact very strongly with phonon polaritons. They basically made phonon polaritons by sort of having uh, gold, which provides uh, sort of like surface polaritons. And then they have, uh, uh, I think, polystyrene in this case, which has photons and so hybridization of these sort of, uh, phonons and, uh, 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 and plus, sorry, surface, uh, plasmons from uh, gold and uh, uh, photons uh, and phonons, right, from polystyrene gives you this kind of phonon polaritons. And these uh, phonon polaritons are sort of uh, very sort of in the right frequency range uh, to interact also with uh, phonons uh, of uh, YBCO, which of course corresponds to some uh, infrared active, it's charged degree of freedom. And what they found is that this is in this system, they uh, 
there is a dramatic enhancement of ferromagnetism, right? So material which was not ferromagnetic actually shows a giant uh, uh, sort of uh, hysteresis and this uh, ferromagnetism even competes with superconductivity at lower temperature. Well, it's very tempting to say, we, like, what's our usual criterion uh, for uh, ferromagnetism? It's toner instability. And it's set by the density of states and the density of states is determined by the effective mass. So if we make the effective mass heavier, uh, by having a strong uh, light matter coupling, then we can enhance uh, ferromagnetic instability. And uh, and Actually, uh, okay, we, and then we, there we were need also... to get to some questions because I think there are some questions about the more basic theoretical part of the work. So, but if we do those quickly, and then maybe if there's time, we could hear more. Okay, about, let me uh, just like questions. this slide, uh, and then we can go to the questions. Right. So uh, yeah, so there were also interesting uh, experiments also by Besson's group where. Again, uh, they sort of use the strong hybridization uh, of uh, following degrees of freedom in, in superconductors uh, with uh, 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 with uh, sort of like this polaritonic modes, uh, also in some kind of polymer uh, gold uh, uh, heterostructure, and uh, again they could see enhancement of TC. Uh, let's say uh, in uh, this buckyball superconductor. Well which is very tempting to say that could be also manifestation of uh, enhancement of uh, the mass. Uh, and when you have enhanced mass, you have increased in density of state. So by BCS formula, TC could be increased. Okay, uh, in YBCO, the effect was opposite, but as we saw YBCO, like perhaps like other instabilities, maybe even ferromagnetism uh, come into play. Uh, 